This is the Retirement Lifestyle Advocates radio program. I'm your host, Dennis Tubergen. Glad you decided to listen in today. Hey, if you've not yet requested the July special report titled Making Sense of Nonsense, I'd like to invite you to get your free copy. All you need to do to get a copy of the report, which explains where are we now, what should you be thinking about, and if you've got money in an IRA or 401k, in my view, this is really must-reading. Uh, just go to requestyourreportnow.com. I'll be glad to send you a complimentary copy of the report. Again, the website is requestyourreportnow.com. Joining me in the second and third segments of today's program is Mr. Jim Rogers. Uh, Jim uh, made a real name for himself as the co-founder of the Quantum Fund. Uh, he is now an international investor and author. Uh, I caught up with him uh, this past week from his offices in Singapore. And uh, Jim is going to tell you where he's investing now, and he's going to offer you some advice for the current economy. So you won't want to miss that conversation. You know, we've been talking a lot here on the program about currency creation. The Federal Reserve, which is the central bank of the United States, and in the fourth segment of today's program, I'm going to talk about the history of the Federal Reserve. I'm going to share with you some things that you've probably never heard before, but I think are important for you to understand because it gives you some context as to where we are today. Well, there was an article published on Bloomberg about this currency creation this past week. The article is titled, A $9 trillion binge turns central banks into the market's biggest whales. Now, the article said this, and I quote, Since the start of the pandemic, central banks in the United States, Europe, and Japan have been on a $9 trillion spending spree. That binge has turned the U.S. Federal Reserve, the European Central Bank, and the Bank of Japan into the ultimate market whales, swelling their combined assets to $24 trillion dollars. Now, I thought the article did a really good job of offering some perspective on just how much money $24 trillion is. The article published an interactive chart that allowed the reader to select companies from a list, and then the chart added together the value or the market capitalization of each company, and you could keep adding companies to the list until the total combined value of these companies totaled $24 trillion. Now, if you're using the RLA app, all you need to do is go look at the last Portfolio Watch newsletter, and there is a link to the article. If you're not yet using the app, all you need to do is visit the App Store on your smartphone and search for your RLA. Search for it as one word. That's Y-O-U-R-R-L-A. You can get the app and you can get a link to the article, which I would encourage you to do, and you can go check this out for yourself. Well, I went through the exercise of selecting companies, and it took 77 of the world's largest companies to get the combined value of these companies to $24 trillion. Now, these corporations are some of the largest in the world. My list included Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, McDonald's, Nestle, Johnson & Johnson, Samsung, Facebook, Tesla, Coca-Cola, Walmart. It's a very long list. And when you look at the list of companies and realize that their combined valuation equals the currency creation literally out of thin air of the U.S. Federal Reserve, the European Central Bank, and the Bank of Japan, it's really alarming. Because to reach a combined value of $24 trillion, these 77 companies had to develop products and services that consumers desired and then build their businesses over time. Now, by contrast, the central banks of the United States, Europe, and Japan simply created $24 trillion in new currency. Now, as we all know, and as we've been talking about here on the program, Currency creation is simply out of control. It's off the charts. I'll talk about this with Jim Rogers in the next segment as well. Now, the article 
talks a bit about where this newly created currency went. The Fed, which is the central bank of the United States, bought a higher proportion of mortgage-backed securities than did the European Central Bank and the Bank of Japan. The Fed wanted to shore up a sector that caused so much trouble during the financial crisis of 2008. Get this, the Fed spent enough on mortgage-backed securities to buy more than a million homes in New York. And ironically, the Fed propping up this sector has, in my opinion, created a big housing bubble. Now, the European Central Bank and the Bank of Japan did more with loans to keep businesses afloat. The Japanese Central Bank's extra lending, get this, would cover the debts of every company that has gone out of business in Japan since the autumn of 2003. Now, this currency creation in which central banks have been engaging and are continuing to engage is ostensibly done to help those who were most adversely affected by the economic fallout that occurred as a result of the COVID response. But the reality is this money creation, this currency creation, actually ended up helping wealthy folks a lot more than it did people that were at the bottom end of the income earning spectrum. Why is that? Well, technology stocks, real estate, typically those are owned by wealthy people. They're not owned by poor people. And the Fed itself published some data that 60% of the net worth growth in 2020 went to the top 10% of the wealthiest households, and only 4% of the net worth growth went to the bottom 50% of U.S. households. Now, I've been talking about this for a long time. The reality is that currency creation in the name of helping the poor actually, eventually, and inevitably ends up helping, ends up hurting the poor rather more than it helps them. Now, I was reading a Forbes article this past week which talks about this phenomenon. And when you listen to these statistics, they are almost unbelievable. The number of billionaires on the Forbes list of the world's wealthiest, these are billionaires, exploded to 2,755. That's 660 more billionaires on the list now than a year ago. Now, if you do some math, that is a new billionaire every 13 hours. And 86% of those on the list gained in wealth. They were richer than they were a year ago. See, a year ago, the combined net worth of all billionaires in the United States was $8 trillion dollars. It's now $13.1 trillion. That's huge growth. Now, I believe that we have collectively ignored the sage advice given to us by one of our founding fathers. Thomas Jefferson said that if the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their currency, and yes, the Federal Reserve is a private bank, In the fourth segment of today's program, I'm going to talk to you about how the Federal Reserve was formed and some of the names of the families that were involved or influenced the origination and the founding of the Federal Reserve are the names of the families that you will recognize today. I think you'll find the information I'm going to cover in the fourth segment today to be eye-opening. But back to what Thomas Jefferson warned us about. He said, quote, if the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their currency, first by inflation, then by deflation, the banks and corporations that will grow up around them will deprive the people of all property until their children wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. The issuing power should be taken from the banks and restored to the people to whom it properly belongs. 
Now, I'm releasing a revised and updated version of the revenue sourcing book that was published last year. Its title is Retirement Roadmap, How Many Aspiring Retirees Can Use the Revenue Sourcing Process to Achieve a Secure Tax-Free Retirement in Today's Economy. That book will be released in a little more than a month. One of the themes of the book is the difference between currency and money. See, back when the Federal Reserve was formed, currency and money were the same thing. Gold circulated as currency. And the difference between money and currency is simple. Money is a good store of value over time. Currency is not. And since 1971, the U.S. dollar has not had a direct link to gold. So it's been a fiat currency which has allowed the Federal Reserve, this private bank, to create as much currency as they desire. See, the U.S. dollar was once an asset, but it is now a debt-based currency, as are all other world currencies. And the huge amount of currency creation by world central banks is now causing an acceleration of inflation, as Mr. Jefferson predicted. But at some future point, this inflation will have to give way to deflation as debts go unpaid and debt-based money disappears from the financial system. Now, I talk about this in detail in the July report titled Making Sense of Nonsense. If you've not yet requested your free copy, I'd love to send you a copy. Go to the website, requestyourreportnow.com. The website, again, is requestyourreportnow.com. Let us know where to mail the report, and I'll be very glad to do that. I will return after these words with the legendary Jim Rogers. Stay with us. Welcome back to RLA Radio. I'm your host, Dennis Tubergen. Joining me today on the program is international investor and author, Mr. Jim Rogers. And Jim, welcome back to the program. Pleasure to see you again. I'm delighted to be here, Dennis. So, Jim, I would like your take on the massive currency creation that's going on by all the major central banks around the world. How much longer can this go on? Dennis, that's very perceptive and very worrisome to me. It has never happened in recorded history to this extent. You know, the head of the Bank of Japan goes to work every morning and in his words says, prints unlimited, unlimited amounts of money. The U.S. has never printed so, I mean, everywhere, everywhere in the world. It's happening. Uh, it's going to end very badly when it ends. It will end, I assure you. And when it ends, it's going to end very, very badly. Dennis, I will tell you, you know, uh, you and I are Americans. Well, it's a good time to be an old American because we don't have to pay for all of this. But being a young American, young America is going to inherit, inherit some huge problems. So, Jim, what would you say uh, about Jerome Powell stating that inflation is transitory? It's, it's just a result of the economy reopening. Do you buy that? Dennis, I have been around a long time and I have learned not to pay attention to these guys. All they care about is keeping their jobs. They don't care about you or me or kids. They care about keeping their jobs. And he thinks that's the way to keep his job. And he will say some absurd things. You go back and read some of the central bankers, in, not just in America, but everywhere. And you cannot believe the things that come out of their mouths. But they think that's what they have to say. So where do you see inflation going? I mean, here in the United States, uh, they'll admit to a 5% inflation rate. John Williams says it's closer to 13%. What's your take? And uh, what's the end game? Well, Dennis, I was going to say, yeah, 5% is what the government says, but the government always lies about it. I mean, anybody who goes shopping knows knows that prices are going up more than the government says, and they always do. Governments, especially the U.S. government, have, have reasons to lie about these things. Uh, I would suspect that I, I know that there will be dips, and at times it will look better. Certainly they'll say it's better, but over the next few years, it can only go higher because they have printed staggering amounts of money all over the world. And of course, shortages are beginning to develop in some parts of the world economy. You know, it's a good time. I, well, go ahead. No, I'm just going to say, Jim, that uh, 
a lot of our listeners are aspiring to a comfortable, stress-free retirement. Many are already retired. When you say this is going to end ugly, I know they would like to know exactly what you think, given your reputation. How, what does ugly look like? Well, you may remember bear markets in the past. Uh, you may remember 2008 or some of the previous ones. In bear markets, everything goes down a lot or nearly everything. You know, many stocks will go down 50, 60, 80 uh, percent in a bear market. Property will collapse. Uh, I mean, it's not fun when we have bear markets. And Dennis, we've had bear markets for centuries, millennium, and we're going to have more. Uh, And I know that a lot of people are going to lose a lot of money. I hope that your listeners know enough and learn enough to protect themselves. I hope I protect myself. It's a lot of people going to lose a lot of money. This is going to be the worst bear market in my lifetime, Dennis. And I say that because in 2008, we had a horrible time because of too much debt. Dennis, since 2008, the debt everywhere has skyrocketed by gigantic amounts. Nobody, America's, no country in the world has ever been as indebted as we in the U.S. are. This has never happened. So the next bear market is going to be horrendous. So, Jim, there are those analysts that say the the, the coming bear market is going to make 1929 to into the 30s into the Great Depression look tame. Do you think we're looking at something along those lines? Well, I know I know it's going to be the worst in my lifetime. I wasn't around in 1929. Uh, I wasn't insinuating you were for the record. No, I know I understand. <laughs> I, I'm just quickly explaining. Um, but it's certainly going to be the worst in my lifetime, and we've had some bad ones in my in my lifetime, 2008. Well, it, you know the the rest of them. Um, No, a lot of people are going to lose a lot of money. The debt is staggering, not just at the government level, at the state government level, company level, individual level. I hope that all of your listeners, if they have debt, that they're doing their best to cut back. If they have debt, I hope it is fixed rate debt, because if you have floating rate debt, you're going to suffer badly going forward. And I hope that you have investments that will protect you. So, Jim, when you talk about people losing a lot of money, let's focus on stocks because using one of the most often used uh, stock market valuation indicators, market cap to GDP, stocks are like 30 plus percent more overvalued than prior to the tech stock bust. So why have stocks gotten so overvalued? Is that just attributable to Fed policy or what's your opinion? Well, it's uh, mainly Fed policy because so much staggering amounts of money have been invested. But then throughout history, when you have a bull market that lasts for a while, it it gathers momentum. This bull market has been going on, what, 12 years or something in the U.S., which is the longest in American history. All the signs develop. New investors come in. They tell their friends, this is easy. This is fun. They all jump in and out of fabulous new stocks. SPACs come along. SPACs have been around for hundreds of years, and they always show up again at the end of a bull market, near the end of a bull market. All of these things have happened. It's not the first time I've seen this movie, Dennis. And when it happens, people get very enthusiastic, and excitement breeds excitement. And then it comes to an end. Well, if you're just joining us, my guest today is international investor and author, Mr. Jim Rogers. Uh, Many of our longtime listeners probably recall that Jim was kind enough to join us a few years ago, and he was nice enough to take some time out of his morning in Singapore uh, to catch up with us. So, Jim, is there anything that's not in a bubble? I mean, stocks are in a bubble. Uh, Walk through some asset classes that may not be. Not all stocks. (laughs) are in a bubble, but some, I mean, Amazon goes up every day, 10 cents, Samsung, some stocks, but others still, the reason I'm not selling yet is because I still see some stocks have not joined the party. Bonds are definitely in a bubble. Bonds have never been this expensive in the history of the world, all over the world. Property in many places, you go to Korea or New Zealand or many places in the U.S., many places, properties definitely in a bubble because of, of, of so much money printing and low interest rates. The only thing I see, Dennis, is the still cheap or commodities. I mean, silver is down 50 percent from its all time high. Sugar is down 70 percent from its all time high. Oil is down 50 percent from its all time high. Uh, these are not bubble numbers. 
Uh, so that's the, and as you know, if we have inflation, that means prices go higher. Well, the way, a way to protect yourself is to own commodities. I mean, if the price of bread goes up and you own wheat, you're okay. You might even make money to protect yourself. So Jim, I know our listeners, given your reputation as an investor, would love to know uh, what else you're investing in. You mentioned you own stocks yet. Uh, what's your take on say gold and silver? Well, I own both. Uh, I'm not buying either at the moment. When I buy again, I will probably buy silver. Silver is cheaper than gold on a historic basis. But if gold goes down a lot, I'll buy gold to, more gold too. Uh, I expect both of them to do extremely well before this is over, but I am not buying now. I have no idea how long the correction will last. I'm not a very good market timer, but I will definitely buy more before this is over because in the end, they're both going to go up a great deal. So, Jim, I'm curious to what your perspective would be uh, in, a, in, a, in a crash situation when a bubble unwinds, cash is a good asset to have. In an inflationary environment, cash is obviously not a good asset to have. How do you balance that? Well, uh, as I say, if there's inflation and you own the things that are going up in price, not only do you protect yourself, you make money. Uh, you know, people, there are people who've come out of every bear market in world history very well, well off. Uh, not everybody, most people lose, but you know, there were people came out of the 1930s rich. Uh, so if you protect yourself, you know, if, if you listen to RL ra radio and you know what's going on, you might protect yourself and you might even make a lot of money. I mean, I said agriculture is very cheap. I, I have been buying an agricultural ETF uh, recently because I expect agriculture prices to go up a whole lot. And that means if the price of your shirt goes up, you're going to make money on cotton. So in your opinion, if you have someone that's managing money in an IRA or a, a 401k, are exchange traded funds the best way to get exposure to commodities? Well, for most people, uh, many studies have shown not just commodities, but for every asset that uh, index investing is the most successful. Uh, index investing outperforms nearly all professional and amateur investors. So for most people, yes. And I, I love uh, index investing because it's easy and I'm lazy. <laughs> when it comes to uh, owning gold and silver, do you use ETFs or do you like the physical stuff? I have it in my closet, you know, I, the <laughs> politician, politicians and academics say forget gold and silver. But Dennis, I'm an old peasant and all of us old peasants know that when things go bad, we want a little gold over there in the closet. We want a little silver under the bed. I, I have both, but I have a lot of physical. Well, my guest today is international investor and author, Mr. Jim Rogers. Jim has agreed to join us for one more segment, and he will do that when RLA Radio returns. Stay with us. Welcome back to RLA Radio. I'm your host, Dennis Tubergen. I have the distinct pleasure of chatting today on the program with international investor and author, Mr. Jim Rogers. Uh, and Jim, we were talking a bit about ways to protect yourself from um, inflation and, and the coming crash. Um, I would love to get your take on cryptocurrencies. Well, I have never bought nor sold any cryptocurrency, Dennis. I mean, of course, I wish I had. I wish I'd bought Bitcoin at one dollar. I mean, it's now thirty-one thousand. Of course, I wish I'd bought IBM in nineteen fourteen. Also, I mean, I've made missed a lot of great investments in my life. Uh, my view is that, well, first of all, we are all money is going to be on the computer soon. All governments, including the U.S., are working on crypto money. Uh, in China, you cannot buy ice cream with money. You cannot take a taxi. They're, they're way ahead of us as far as crypto money is concerned, and everybody's going to do it. But as far as cryptocurrencies, uh, independent ones, when, when the money is on the computer, I cannot imagine that the U.S. is going to say, okay, this is your money now. You must use it on the computer. I, now, I cannot imagine the U.S. is going to say, but if you want to use that other money, you can. It's not the way governments work. They don't want to lose their monopoly. They don't want to lose their control. So I would suspect that if cryptocurrencies become successful as currencies, which the advocates say they will, governments will react and control them or tax them or regulate them or make them illegal. 
governments, you know how governments work. So Jim, when you start talking about central bank digital currencies, that's really become a very hot topic. Uh, Janet Yellen mentioned that that uh, should be a priority of the Fed. Jerome Powell said they're looking very closely at it. Um, you know, that seems to be a, a government's dream because you can see every transaction, you can impose negative interest rates. Do you think central bank digital currencies actually become a reality? And if they do, how long do you think it'll take? Dennis, they love it. They can know everything you do. They will call you up one day and say, Dennis, you have been drinking too much coffee this month. Stop. They will. It's. They don't have to print it. They don't have to transport it. They don't have to secure it. Well, the same kind of security is much cheaper for them, and they have total control. Now, I don't like that, but they love it. Oh my gosh! You know how the people that work for the government think. But how long will it take? I don't know. As I say, it's already here in China. Uh, it's uh, not 100% in China, but it's it's already happening. Uh, it's very simple to do. That risk, of course, that when, when the internet goes down, you don't. Nobody has any money, or if the electricity goes down, nobody has any money. But the governments, they, they don't particularly care about you and me. They care about their control and their power and their jobs. Jim, I've read that uh, some of the uh, digital currency trials in China uh, haven't gone as well as the officials there have hoped. Is, is there any truth to that? Since you're there, well. I, I'm not in, I'm in Singapore, I'm not Singapore. in China and haven't been for a, a year or so because it's hard to travel, but I'm sure they, I'm sure there've been mistakes and problems. I mean, that's the way the world works. Uh, nobody is perfect that I know of anyway, except Washington, Washington, D.C. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure they've had problems and I'm sure, I'm sure all the governments will have problems as they develop crypto money. But Dennis, I, I don't like saying it, but I'm sure it's coming. So Jim, uh, when, a, when the government implements that, do you, do you think they would implement it alongside cash and just let people get used to the convenience of a digital currency and then phase out cash? Or given the extreme conditions in which we now find ourselves worldwide, do you think it might be more abrupt than that? No, I suspect that they will have a side by side for a while because A, that to be I hope that they're careful and, and let the problems emerge. Uh, but eventually, no, they want to have everything on the computer. Now, of course, that does present problems because not everybody has a computer. Not everybody has electricity in the world. And, you know, so it's not that simple. But no, I'm sure that they would be side by side, at least at first. In China, it's side by side. You can still use some money. It's, it's hard to use money in China, but you can still use it in some places. So do you ever think, Jim, uh, you know, when you study history, when, when fiat currencies have failed, often uh, people only trust gold and silver as money again. And I've interviewed a number of people here on the program that feel that we will eventually get back to a gold and silver based money system, even if it's digital currency backed by gold or silver. Do you envision that that could be a possibility? Well, Dennis, anything can be a possibility, especially in, in crisis. Uh, of course it can be. Uh, I do know that for thousands of years, people have relied on gold and silver in emergencies. And when things get really bad, we're all going to look for something. And history would indicate that gold and silver will have a place in that kind of world. And I know that we're going to have more crises in the future. Janet Yellen said, no, 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 we've got everything under control. No more bear markets. No more economic problem. Well, if you believe her and she's got some Ivy League degrees, fine. But I know history shows no problems are coming again. And I have some gold and silver in case. If you have something else, Dennis, let me know. But I do know that gold and silver have always come through disasters. Do you have a target upside for gold or silver, Jim? No, I'm not that smart. I mean, I'm, there are people who will give you numbers, but I'm not smart enough to do that, Dennis. Well, I have the pleasure of chatting today with international investor and author, Mr. Jim Rogers. And Jim, I'd like to go back and revisit a couple of things we talked about in the first segment, if I could. You mentioned that you, you feel that, you know, obviously we're, we're in a bubble here with bonds for sure. Some stocks uh, may not yet have reached their full potential. Could you expand on that? Are there, are there any sectors in the stock market that you like at this point? 
Well, anything that's been beaten down uh, by disaster, travel, tourism, airlines, entertainment, uh, hotels, restaurants. Yeah, there are things that I'm looking for. I bought a Russian shipping company recently, Chinese wine company recently. You know, all disasters lead to opportunities. So I'm looking with the things that have been beaten. I know, Dennis, we're not going to take the boat to London in the future. We're all going to fly again. So I'm looking for opportunities and things that I know will resume. Talk a bit about commodities. Uh, we talked a bit about gold and silver and agricultural commodities. Um, your favorites uh, among commodities and those that maybe you don't like as much? Well, I said silver instead of gold going forward. Uh, I said agriculture. I mean, agriculture has been a disaster for many years. The average age of farmers in America is 58. In Japan, it's 66. I mean, agriculture has been horrible, Dennis. Highest rate of suicide in the UK. It's in agriculture. So most agricultural commodities are probably a good place to be. I bet nobody you know from college became a farmer. They all went to radio or Wall Street or something <laughs> like that. Uh, but that's going to change in the future because the farmers are going to make a lot of money. I mean, their ETFs on the New York Stock Exchange make it easy to do now. But if you're really good at it, I mean, buy sugar futures. Uh, I'm not doing it just because I'm lazy, but but I do own RJA. It's the, the Rogers Commodity Index on the New York Stock Exchange. It's very easy to buy and sell, at least for me. Digging into agriculture, Jim, do you see a return to family farming or do you think that the corporate farm is here to stay? Well, it depends on where. Uh, in the U.S., obviously, corporate farming has, has got a great future just because that's where the money and the, and the expertise is. But in many parts of the world, you know, family farms are going to have a great revival because that's all that's left at the moment. Uh, I mean, if you and I dropped into Siberia, I doubt if we would be good corporate farmers. But, you know, the Russians have a long history of wonderful agriculture and it's, it's coming back. It's coming back strong as we speak. But many parts of the world, South America, Africa, many places. So, Jim, are there certain uh, parts of the world in which you're looking to invest as opposed to other parts? Do you have any geographic favorites? Well, the U.S. market is making all time highs. I prefer to look at a place that's depressed. Japan is down 35 percent from its all time high. Russia is hated. You know, there are markets that are still not so exuberant and where there's still more opportunities. So, you know, I learned to buy low and sell high. So I look where things are low. Doesn't mean I get it right, Dennis. Oh my gosh, I make many mistakes, but at least I'd rather start looking at places where things are depressed, not where they're exuberant. Well, my guest today has been international investor and author, Mr. Jim Rogers. Uh, Jim, thank you for being so gracious with your time and coming on the program again. Uh, I know my listeners are going to enjoy this conversation, and uh, uh, thank you for joining us. I'd love to have you back down the road. Well, Dennis, you've got to teach us all because, you know, I hope our, our L.A. radio will save us because a lot of people, including me, might lose their money. So well, you, have, it up. Uh, you have gone a long way to helping the listeners do that. So thank you for joining us. Keep it up. Thank you, Dennis. Bye-bye. Right, Bye-bye now. I'm Dennis Tuberg, and you are listening to RLA Radio. Glad you tuned in today, and thanks again to my special guest today, Mr. Jim Rogers, a very busy guy for taking time out of his schedule and sharing some of it with us. In this segment, I want to talk to you a bit about had it been brought to light in the day, it would have been probably dismissed as pure conspiracy theory. And what I'm talking about is how the Federal Reserve the private bank that controls U.S. monetary policy was formed. Yes, the Federal Reserve is a private bank, and this story as to how it was formed is really quite remarkable. Now, this story is outlined in many books, but in my view, one of the best books on the topic has been written by G. Edward Griffin, and the title of the book is The Creature from Jekyll Island. And I want to give you just a bit from the book, and I quote, Back in 1910, 
Jekyll Island was completely privately owned by a small group of millionaires from New York. We're talking about people such as J.P. Morgan, William Rockefeller, and their associates. This was a social club, and it was called the Jekyll Island Club. That was three years before the National Federal Reserve Act was finally passed into law. It was November of that year when Senator Nelson Aldrich sent his private railroad car to the railroad station in New Jersey, and there it was in readiness for the arrival of himself and six other men who were told to come under conditions of great secrecy. For quite a few years thereafter, these men denied that any such meeting took place. It wasn't until after the Federal Reserve System was firmly established that they began to talk openly about their journey and what they accomplished. Several of them wrote books on the topic, one of them wrote a magazine article, and they gave interviews to newspaper reporters, so now it's possible to go into the public record and document quite clearly and in detail what happened there. So I'd like to share with you a bit about the seven men that wrote the Federal Reserve Act. So here's a list of those who went to Jekyll Island, Georgia, secretly in Senator Aldrich's private railroad car. A private railroad car was the preferred means of transportation for those who were wealthy in 1910. Private jets did not exist. Well, of course, Senator Aldrich, Senator Nelson Aldrich, organized the trip. He was a senator from Rhode Island. He was chair of the National Monetary Commission, and he was a business associate of J.P. Morgan. Here's something else that's very interesting. Nelson Aldrich was the father-in-law of John D. Rockefeller, a name that is often associated with banking. Also in the railroad car was Abraham Andrew, who was Assistant Secretary of the United States Treasury. Interestingly, Mr. Andrew did not tell his boss where he was going. Then there was Frank Vanderlip. Frank was there rep representing William Rockefeller. There's the Rockefeller name again. Mr. Vanderlip was president of the National City Bank of New York. Later in his autobiography, and by later I mean about 20 years after the fact, Mr. Vanderlip shared what happened. He said, I was as secretive, indeed as furtive, as any conspirator. Discovery we knew simply must, must not happen or else all our time and effort would be wasted. If it were to be exposed that our particular group had got together and written a banking bill, that bill would have no chance whatever of passage by Congress. Sounds very conspiratorial, doesn't it? Also in the railroad car, Henry P. Davidson. Mr. Davidson was a senior partner of J.P. Morgan Company. Charles D. Norton also made the trip to Jekyll Island. He was president of J.P. Morgan's First National Bank of New York. We also have Benjamin Strong, who was head of Bankers Trust Company, which also happened to be owned by J.P. Morgan. And finally, the seventh man in the private railroad car was Paul Warburg, who was representing the Rothschild banking dynasties in England and in France. Interestingly, Mr. Warburg also happened to be sworn in as a member of the first Federal Reserve Board in 1914. So these seven men traveled to Jekyll Island secretly and put together a banking bill that three years later would be signed into law by Woodrow Wilson in December of 1913. Now, the article that was the, from which I got this information noted that Fed policies are really a repudiation of fundamental economic principles. And the purpose of the Federal Reserve is to provide a structured system whereby its member banks can create and lend money in perpetuity. The Federal Reserve exists for the benefit of the banks and bankers. Now, you might find it interesting 
as to how the Federal Reserve Act was passed into law. The Federal Reserve was passed into law because the Federal Reserve promised that they would back the government and give them all the money they needed to meet all their expenditures. But let's dig into a couple statements here. One, that the Federal Reserve exists or provides a structured system whereby its member banks can create and lend money in perpetuity. And the second statement is that the Federal Reserve's policies are a repudiation of fundamental economic principles. Well, in 1971, there was still a link between the U.S. dollar and gold. When the Fed was formed, gold was money. Gold was currency. Gold circulated. But over time, the link between the dollar and gold was watered down until in 1971, there was no link to gold. So prior to 1971, and think about this for a minute, currency was an asset because it was redeemable for gold, which has tangible value. Today, because of Fed policy, all money is debt. All money is either loaned into existence or money or currency is created. There is no link to anything tangible. Now, when you look at how the banking system operated pre-COVID, banks were required to maintain a 10% reserve requirement, but could take 90% of any new deposit and loan it out. When that loan was made, more money was created, provided money moved from bank to bank. So just by money moving and by debt being created, more money was created. So money, at this point, is debt. Now, borrowing or the creation of money can only take place as long as there is economic capacity to take on and service more debt. And what happened after 2008 was interest rates were reduced to zero, thinking that lending would pick up, but it didn't. Why? Because we had reached our limit on our collective credit card. It was then that the Fed resorted to the temporary emergency policy of quantitative easing or currency creation, and this is now leading to what will likely be a very predictable outcome. Since 1971, when money became debt, there have been a series of boom and bust cycles that have existed. One only needs to go look at a chart of almost any asset class to see it. And each subsequent boom and bust cycle becomes more severe. And as I talked about with Mr. Jim Rogers in the second segment of today's program, he says that ultimately this is going to lead to the worst crash in his lifetime. I happen to agree. That's why I published the July special report titled Making Sense of Nonsense. In it, you'll get my perspective as to where things are. You'll also get some strategies to consider for your own personal financial situation. I'd love to send you a copy of the report. All you need to do to request it is go to the website, requestyourreportnow.com. The website, again, is requestyourreportnow.com, requestyourreportnow.com, and I'll be glad to send you a copy. That's all the time I have for this week. Hope you got something you can use, and I'll be back again next week. Thanks for tuning in.